but it's my privilege to share with you today. We're going to continue our One Another series, declaring again that at the heart of this series is our call to love one another. John 13, 34, and 35 say, A new command I give you, love one another. As I, as Jesus, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. We strive to be a church, a body, where things are a little different, in a good way. Where when people come in, they hear the Bible preached clearly from the platform. Where they experience God's presence moving in worship. And where when they come in, they're welcomed and they experience God's love and care through the body, through our welcoming. And they want to be part of that. And you know, one of the ways we can demonstrate that love to one another is through encouragement. So that's where we're going today. Encourage one another. How many of you played Little League Baseball? There there are a few of you. I imagine there's more than a few of you. You've been to the field. You remember those first practices where you walk on the field and your hat's too big and it's falling down over your eyes? You put your glove on the one hand and then maybe you put it on the other hand because you're not sure which one it goes on yet. You're still learning that. You throw with your right, but then you catch with your right and you're all confused. You're just trying to remember if I'm running down first base or third base first. All those feelings and and the butterflies are a little more interesting than the baseballs still, maybe. Anyways, you go into those first practices, and you're just trying to get to know people, trying to learn, trying to grow. And with those memories in mind, walk with me into one of my first practices. I don't know the coaches. I don't know the players. And we start practice, and we're set to, to throw right away. Coach wants to see what we can do. He introduces himself, assistant coach and the coach, so that we have a little relationship, we get to know each other, and pretty quickly I'm I'm called out, and uh, the assistant coach calls me over and says, hey Josh, have you ever played catcher? Well, not yet, this is one of my first practices. He said, I think you can be a a good catcher. Well, I'm thinking, boy, this is encouraging, like he's, he's seeing something in me already, that's pretty cool. I'm pretty sure what he was really thinking was, this kid's about a foot taller than anybody else, and he's about a foot wider than anybody else, and he's going to make a great backstop, so the ball probably isn't going to... But a good coach doesn't say that, right? A good coach finds a way to see in you potential and direction that you might not even see yourself. Encouragement is more than a compliment. It's direction. It's pushing you towards something. Compliments may feel good, Right? Somebody says, good job. Somebody says, nice shoes. Your hair looks good. It's temporary. It feels good. But we're talking about something different today. We're talking about biblical encouragement, which is eternal in nature. It's pushing each other, encouraging each other towards his presence and towards the promise of eternity. We're going to start out in 1 Thessalonians today. We're going to be in chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 and 18 say this. Then we who are alive... Or left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. In this very first verse, Paul gives us point one for today. His presence is the direction for our encouragement. Our direction. It's eternal. It's heavenly. It's with the Almighty God. We know in the Holy Spirit he's with us now, but we should always be moving in the pre- towards his presence and towards uh, what he has for us. We're going to encourage each other towards that. Let's consider the perspective of the Thessalonians who first received this letter and the purpose behind the words that God gave Paul here. There are several things I want us to consider. First, this is one of the first letters written in the New Testament. It's one of the earliest books actually recorded. And so there's not a lot of what we consider New Testament doctrine written down. And in the years from Jesus' passing, there was this expectancy that he was soon coming back. But as believers have died, there's a growing question. How soon is he coming back and what's happening to them in the meantime? Consider the mixed cultural expectancy of of what heaven or what the afterlife would look like. Even within the Jewish tradition, there were some different thoughts. There's the Pharisees who believed in eternal hope. And there's the Sadducees who didn't. And that's the old joke. They were sad, you see, because they had no hope. Old joke, bad joke. But just get it in your head because even in that culture, even in that time, there were some mixed views on what they might be expecting. Then you have the historical uh, uh, movement of the Greeks. 
under Alexander the Great, right? They moved through, conquered so much of the known world, and their culture and religion bled into um, the peoples that they, that they conquered. And then the Romans came and expanded that growth through, the, through their building of roads. So in essence, those Greek and Roman traditions and religions were, were evident and had to be fought against in the church. In, in the um, ancient Greek world, there were so many gods and goddesses. You remember your elementary, middle school, Greeks and Romans, gods and goddesses lessons. They were kind of fun when I taught sixth grade, fun to look at, but they weren't true, right? That, not true gods and goddesses. But in that culture, part of your eternity was based on people's memory of you. In essence, it was a works-based salvation. If you did good, you might get to heaven. If you did bad, you, you go to Hades. But there, there was something in between that was based on your memories. Now, as I, as I read that and studied that, I just want to say, praise God that my eternity, my salvation isn't based on the quality of your memories. Like, as I age, my memory starts to go, and your salvation is not dependent on my memories. It's based on the grace of God, the grace of Jesus, right? But there's all these mixed thoughts without what we have as the New Testament. And so Paul is writing to the Thessalonians uh, words from God to, to confirm what many already believed. We're going to go back to verse 13 where Paul sets this up. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. Remember two things here. Number one, he's writing to believers. This is key. There is heaven and hell. There is a difference. And this is written to believers. And he's talking about those who are asleep, those who have died, who have gone to rest with Jesus until a second coming. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others, who, others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Right? It's a direction. Good doctrine, knowing scripture, truth. It helps encourage us. We don't have the doubts that the world does because we know what eternity is in store for us and that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is here with us now, moving. We come together on Sundays and we celebrate, we sing, we worship. We experience God's presence, get a little pumped up. I don't know about you, but I do. I get a little pumped up for the week. I'm ready to go. And then Monday happens and and I get that little hangnail. And then Tuesday happens and I stub my toe. And then Wednesday morning happens, and I can't find my keys. And then I find out there's new management at work or whatever else it is. And by Wednesday night, I need some encouragement. Just a little plug. That's why we do Wednesday night prayer, right? Like we need some encouragement midweek. Come on out, pray. Not just for you, but to encourage one another. To encourage one another. We need godly encouragement from Scripture and from one another to remind us of that eternity, to push us forward into his presence, to push us deeper back into prayer. The second reason the Thessalonians needed encouragement was that struggle of daily life combined with the threat of real persecution. Paul had essentially shared the gospel with the Thessalonians and then been chased out of town by Jews who were jealous of his ministry, scared of what he was teaching. But the Thessalonians were left, and they still had to contend with those jealous Jews. On top of that, we've already talked about the Roman occupation. Roman uh, presence, Roman guards, Roman government, Roman taxes. I don't know about you, but when I look at my tax bill, I can become a little discouraged sometimes. (laughs) Like, praise God for government at the same time. Oh, Lord God, help us, government. Um, But that being said, the Thessalonians had to deal with reality with the threat of persecution, and with daily life. And our persecution, our troubles, may not be the same as the Thessalonians, but they're real, right? They're real. They're real. From grief to sickness, from financial struggles to anxiety, even when things are going good, 
that's when anxiousness can set in. Okay, what's going to happen next? And that's when we need encouragement. That's when we need encouragement. We go back to the word. We come back to fellowship. And we get godly encouragement from one another. And we are reminded, this world is not our home. This moment, this existence is just a blip, right? The things that we spend all of our time on, we, we make out to be so important. They're this much of our eternity. Amen, right? They're this much. They feel big now. And that's where we need the reminder, God is with us and heaven awaits us. And we help each other with those reminders. So how do we encourage one another? Let me give you three quick words. I used them earlier if you were listening. Three words, teach, relate, and demonstrate. Teach, like my little league coach, like a good coach. It helps if you teach people what they need to do and you give them a goal and direction that you want them to follow. Peter tells us a little bit about our direction, the way we can teach others in 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, revere Christ. For us to help and encourage others, God has to be Lord of our lives first. He goes on to say, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. We don't teach with harshness. As Christians, we teach boldly. We teach clearly. We declare scripture. But we do so out of Jesus' heart of love and grace, and forgiveness. As Christians, we want to share the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we want to be in the word, knowing what that truth is, and we want to be reflecting on our testimonies, what God has done for us, so that we're ready to share with others. Always be ready. We relate to, one, to, to others, to one another. The heart of this, again, is the heart of our series, John 14, 34, and 35. A new commandment I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By our love for one another. By the way we relate to one another. Others see who our king really is. Ourselves or our king Jesus. Right? That comes through in the way we relate to one another. As we've heard the last few weeks... It comes through in the way we spur each other on towards love and good deeds, serving together. It shows in the way we bear with each other, how you put up with my annoying habits and I put up with yours, how we love one another through those things. It should look different than what you experience in the world of work or other places with unbelievers. It should look different among believers and in the fellowship. And as we we relate to each other, we find ourselves in godly fellowship. We get the opportunity to demonstrate to one another his goodness and faithfulness. When you're out serving with one another, you're working alongside each other, you find yourself sharing stories. Man, when I was growing up, I went through this, and God moved in me and did this. And I hear that from you, and I'm encouraged. And I relate. There was that time I was sick, and God healed me. And I know you're sick, but I know God is faithful, and he can heal you too. And you're encouraged. And you see us grieve. I see you grieve, and you stay faithful to God. And that's encouraging. That's demonstration that happens when we're walking in godly fellowship. It's not that things are easy. It's that we walk together, encouraging one another, lifting each other up and pointing each other back towards Jesus. The last three weeks, I've been so encouraged as I've sat down at the table to hear the testimony of the three guys that are sharing Wednesday night. Guys, I want to invite you again. I mean, the stories that that we have to share, they're stories of redemption, of transformation, of freedom from addiction, of grace, and beyond that, of even moving from, from living a good life to sanctification where God is using me in ways I never expected. Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, the tacos are a bonus, but it's really about the testimonies about being encouraged. I invite you to come on out. We'll be here at Pathway Wednesday night. We encourage one another. We lift one another up. But we do so with God as our source. I don't have it in me. You don't have it in you to encourage one another unless we're relying on God. 
1 Thessalonians 5, 9 to 11. Same letter, next chapter. This is a continuation of the thought. Verses 9 to 11. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. He's the source, right? We can't save ourselves. We can't do enough good deeds. He's the source. He's the source of our salvation. He's the source of our strength. We're not enough on our own. I get discouraged, don't you? I mean, it happens. It happens. We have to be aware of that and be leaning into him. As I was praying and thinking, God gave me these three words. I want to give them to you. Be diligent to be dependent. Diligent to be dependent. I guess that's four words. <laughs> be diligent to be dependent. We have to be intentional to look back to God. I get up in the morning, I think about my to-do list, and I'm ready to go. I'm ready to get working. I have to stop and pray because I need him. And I know I'm going to get more done when I stop and rest in him first. I pray in the morning, Lord God, what do you have for me today? Because I have my agenda, but yours is more important. And I wait on him to find those things out. John 15, 5 says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I'm not enough. My circumstances will bog me down. But he is enough. He gives me strength. So how do we lean on him? You know this. You, f- you talk to him and listen to him through prayer. You come in to worship and you experience his presence. He fills you up. And you put yourself in places of godly fellowship where brothers and sisters can lift you up and encourage you on. You know, whenever whenever I get to teach or lead a Bible study on something, when I really open myself up to learning, it's funny how God uses that, that study to really push me on things. So several weeks ago already, I was praying, um, I don't prepare quickly in a week. It takes me like a month to prepare a sermon. So it just takes a lot of prayer and a lot of, a lot of preparation. So I'm praying several weeks ago already. And in, in prayer, I become aware that I haven't really felt really clear direction uh, to do something specific for God for, for a little while. And so I just started praying about that. Lord God, I want to be used. I want to be obedient. I need a little push. And I can't say he answered me in that moment. I mean, it's nice when he does, but it wasn't in that moment. But that was my prayer. Lord God, I want to be open. I want to be used. Stir in me. It's that intentional time uh, to be dependent. So I'm driving to work that morning. And I know, guys, especially some of you, you're driving along. You're thinking about all sorts of stuff. Fishing, golf, football, whatever it is, right? I've told you before, my mind drifts off to disc golf way too often. It, okay, I'm, I'm a hokey, I'm a nerd that way, but it's what I like. So, I'm driving to work, and all of a, I'm thinking about disc golf, I'm thinking about a, a specific disc. It puts me back on a specific course I remember a shot on. And as I'm thinking about this, I'm reminded last time I was on that course, I was with my brother-in-law. And the moment, I'm telling you, the moment makes me tear up now, because the moment I thought, of him specifically, I was like overwhelmed. Just this, I, this knowing that something was going on. And so while I'm driving, I'm praying, Lord God, be with him, strengthen him, speak to him, Lord God. I don't know what he's going through, but I know there's something, like in my spirit, in my soul, I know there's something going on. So I'm praying on the drive to work. And I pull in here and I text him. Hey, man, I don't know what's going on, but I really felt this burden to pray for you. So know that you're prayed for, know that God's enough, and he's got this. And he texts back. Now, let me, let me stop there. My brother-in-law and I don't have that relationship. We see each other four times a year when we travel back and forth. I never text him. This was so out of character, so out of the norm. But it was, God, what do you have for me to do? And I was obedient. He texts back almost instantly. I needed that so bad. Okay, let's talk later. So I called him later that night. He was at work. I needed to get stuff started. But he knew I was praying for him. So we talked that night. And he's, he's a mechanic in a, a factory. But he's got some significant leadership responsibilities too. And he said, yeah, man, this last week's been tough. There have been so many fires at work. 
And I'm like, fires, like emotional fires, I'm used to dealing with those. He's like, no, no. I'm talking major catastrophic fires, uh, machines, oil, things on fire through the building. And that has stirred up people's emotions to where there's conflict to the point of danger. And in that, in that as leader, I'm, I'm stretched. Am I enough? Do I have this? But he said, after the text reminding him that God has this, he went back to prayer. And that prayer changed his perspective on the rest of things. And checking in with him, God just used that moment to stir him, to change things, and to resolve situations and move forward. God didn't do anything through me. I didn't go fix his problems. All I did was point him back to Jesus, and him being pointed back to Jesus, back to prayer, was enough to change his direction and course. Praise God. We're not enough. We're not the source, but he is. He is. I want to interject something else very quickly here. Those verses in 1 Thessalonians 5 that we were just looking at. The last verse mentioned the wrath of God. You know, I want to remind us that this letter is written to believers. Some of you grew up fearing the wrath of God as Christians. For those who haven't given their heart to Jesus, there should be a rational fear of God. Heaven and hell are real. They're real. And the real fear should be being apart from God. As believers, there's a healthy fear of being separated from God. But we know that nothing, nothing can separate us from God as believers. And these verses should remind us as believers of God's intent, of his will for us. First Thessalonians 5, to believers it says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation. That's his design, that's what he has for us. For those of us who, are put up, who have put our faith in Jesus, we know that our salvation is real and it's firm. It's a, it's a firm foundation. His grace is enough. But if you haven't given your heart to Jesus, I do want you to understand there is a real place called hell. And he doesn't want you there. I don't want you there. Nobody wants you there. It's a choice. And I hope that today God stirs in you and you're ready to give your heart to God. Because that's what his, his design is for. It's for salvation. So that we know that we are encouraged towards his presence. That's our direction, right? We know that he's got to be the source. He's got to be the source of our encouragement. We're not enough. I want to look at one more verse. Uh, uh, two more verses, actually. Hebrews 3, 12, and 13 uh, that also talk about encouragement. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So why do we need encouragement? What's the real reason? Sin is the reason we need encouragement. Sin is deceitful. The enemy wants us stuck in our own thoughts. The enemy wants us stuck in discouragement. God gives us hope. There's a stark contrast there. Tim Delina, pastor of Times Square Church, says it this way in his 360 journal. In these verses, Hebrews 3, 12, and 13, we are told that any one of us can find our heart moving into unbelief. The writer says that we are to be aware of that enemy. And before we can be afraid, we are told there is an answer to it. Encouragement. He uses the church to point you back to Jesus. And he uses you in the church to point me, to point us back to Jesus. We need one another. We need to encourage one another. How does this happen, both the discouragement and encouragement? I know that most of you already know this in your heart. You've been through seasons where you felt encouraged. You've been through seasons where you feel discouraged. But discouragement creeps in. It sets in when we're not looking for it. We get really busy. We get really busy. We miss church. I'm tired, so I, I just decide to rest instead of coming to prayer or going to life group. Or I just, things happen and I don't check in with my Christian brothers and sisters. I just get busy. And that affects my desire to be in the Word, to pray. Pretty soon, pretty soon I look up and it's been a week since I've really talked to God. And while that all is happening in, this, in, my, in my busyness, 
the world is still pouring in, right? They're still sin and deceit. I hear about changes at work. I get, I get fearful. I turn on the news and I hear the world is ending sometime in November when the elections happen. I mean, we laugh, but isn't that what's being said? Like, we can't, I mean, vote, pray, vote, but God's in control. God's in control. He is king, regardless of what happens in the election. Pray, vote, but know that he's in control. But when those are the influences that we fill ourselves with, pretty soon those influences lead me to doubt. Could a good God really allow all this to happen? And pretty soon my faith is just, it's diminished. But God has a different design for your lives. He wants you to be encouraged. And that's what happens when we come together. When we hear testimonies, when we share with one another. When I'm with godly brothers and sisters, they challenge me to take my cares to God, to pray more. Cast your burdens upon the Lord. He's faithful. He's strong. When I'm in need, my brothers, my sisters come alongside me. They give me a hug. They help me with a task. And them being there lets me know I'm not alone in this battle. That's what godly fellowship is. That's why we encourage one another. Don't walk away when things are tough. You need to be in the church. And we remind each other of truth. Again, teach, relate, demonstrate. God is faithful. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And God uses the church to reinforce his love for me as they walk beside me and go through things with me. And I go through things with them and help them. That's my encouragement. Our hearts ultimately should be for one another as Paul's was for the Romans. Romans 1, 11, and 12, he writes, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that as we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. We need to be together regularly to mutually encourage one another that our hearts are not deceived. The world will influence us. We need to, we need to influence ourselves but by putting ourselves in position to be in godly fellowship. Two quick action points. These are really simple, and we're going to move into a closing. Number one, be open to encouragement. I know that when things are tough, it's easy to kind of shut down, to walk away from people. But God's design is that we're open to our brothers and sisters helping us and speaking to us and with us. Stay in Scripture. Don't forget how much God loves you. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, whatever your circumstances, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. If you've, if you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, that is your promise. Nothing can separate you from his love. Be encouraged. Some of you got this. You, you already feel encouraged. You know those truths and you remind yourself of them regularly. Then what's your role? It's our privilege and responsibility to encourage one another, to be active, to be praying, to be diligent, to be dependent. Lord God, how do you want to use me? Where does my brother or sister have a need? Maybe not even physical, but emotional or spiritual. What do they need to hear from me? Do they just need to know that I'm praying? Sometimes that's enough. Just that we're pointing each other back to Jesus. Again, Peter said, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Use the scripture that God's placed on your heart to encourage one another. Let your testimonies, how God saw you through weakness, speak life and faith into others. When I'm with my brothers and sisters, it's not, look what I did this week. That gets old real fast, right? It's look what God has done how God healed me, how God transformed me, how God changed me. The attention is on God, not on me. His strength is proved perfect in our weakness. And that's the strength of our testimony. Don't be afraid to share those things. They're powerful. And they lift 
he lift us up towards God, towards God. His presence is our direction. That's where we're moving to, right? We've got something to look forward to as believers, a heavenly home, and we know that the Holy Spirit is in us to direct us daily. He's there with us through it all. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? I said earlier, part of, part of our, uh, part of the truth of this scripture, we're not destined for wrath. God had a plan for our salvation. The truth is that we're all sinners. We're all sinners, whether it's pride, selfishness, drunkenness, or something else. We're all sinners. We all need a savior. We serve a holy God, and sin cannot be in his presence, but that's why he sent Jesus. He lived a perfect life. The Son of God lived a perfect life, and he went to the cross willingly to take the place that we deserved, the place of our sins. He accepted those sins upon himself that we might be saved and that we might be with God. In essence, if you're here today and you've not given your heart to God, his design is not that you would be separated from him in hell. His design was that you would be saved so that you could be with him eternally. But that's a choice that he leaves you to make, simply to say, I believe in God and I'm willing to accept his grace. And in turn, as I understand his love, I'm gonna follow him for the rest of my life. That's the choice he leaves us. And know that the encouragement we talked about today is for believers. That direction, that eternal hope is a promise for believers. It's an amazing gift for believers. I know sometimes we pray for salvation with eyes closed, but the heart of today is that we're here to encourage one another. So I'm not gonna have you close your eyes, but if there's somebody here today who's ready to take that step, I wanna give the opportunity and we wanna encourage you and pray with you because we're a body of believers. Knowing that if you're stepping into that body, if you're giving your heart to Jesus, we're here to walk with you and encourage you. So is there anybody here today that is ready to take that step? I need to give my heart to God. I wanna get right with God. I wanna accept his gift of salvation. Or somebody who's walked away and I wanna get right with God. I wanna give my heart back to Jesus. Is there anybody here today? Just raise your hand if that's you. That's okay. Praise God, we're all heading the same place, right? Praise God, like we have an eternal home. If there's somebody who didn't feel comfortable in that moment to raise their hand and you still have questions, there's plenty of us, pastors, elders, others, who would love to just speak with you more about the gift of salvation and the grace of God. And we'd love to walk you through scripture and help you understand it. And we'd love to pray with you and encourage you as you take steps towards faith. But that is the body of believers. That's who we are here to be. We have a lot of things uncommon between us, but Jesus is the one thing we all have in common, and that's how we move forward together, by keeping the main thing the main thing. Church, I know life is just full of seasons, and so before we go, I just want to pray encouragement over you that we can keep the main thing the main thing and that we have the strength to go together, all right? So would you bow with me at this time?